In the previous video, we showed how the Routh array method can be used to determine the stability limits of a closed loop transfer function based on the roots of the characteristic equation. In this video, we're going to look at two additional methods, the direct substitution method and the root locus diagram method, both of which can be used to find the stability limits of closed loop transfer functions. First, consider a characteristic equation that's third order in S and has an unknown variable kc, or the controller gain. And we want to ask the question, for what values of the controller gain is a process with this characteristic equation going to be stable? We know that when a root of the characteristic equation crosses the imaginary axis from the left-hand side to the right-hand side, that root represents an unstable pole of the closed loop transfer function. At the point at which a root crosses the imaginary axis, its real part is zero and its imaginary part may be non-zero. So to find a value of the unknown coefficient kc representing a stability limit, we can substitute s equals j omega into the characteristic equation. The value of kc that we obtain we'll call kcm. It represents either a minimum or a maximum of kc. To show how this works, in this characteristic equation, we'll substitute s equals j omega. When we cube j omega, we end up with minus j omega cubed. And when we square j omega, we end up with minus omega squared. The s in the third term just becomes j omega. This equation now has both real and imaginary parts. The real parts have no j's, and the imaginary parts are the terms that have j's in them. Both the real and imaginary parts must be equal to zero for the sum of these terms to be equal to zero. So we can now separate the real and imaginary parts and set them both equal to zero. This enables us to solve for both omega, an unknown frequency, and kc, the limit of the controller gain. First, from the imaginary part, we find that minus 10 omega squared plus 8 must be equal to zero, which means that omega must be equal to either zero or plus or minus 0.894. That can then be substituted into the real part of the equation to find that kc has a limit at minus 1 and at 12.6. At these two values of kc, the roots of this characteristic equation lie on the imaginary axis, and therefore those two values of kc represent limits of the stability for this process. Now to find out whether the process represented by this characteristic equation is stable for the region between minus 1 and 12.6, or whether the region between minus 1 and 12.6 represents the unstable region, we would have to select a value of kc inside and outside of this range, and then again find the roots to determine whether it's in the stable or the unstable region. The root locus diagram provides a graphical representation of how this direct substitution method works, and it also provides more information about how the roots of the characteristic equation representing the poles of the closed loop transfer function change as we change the values of kc. To show how this works, we'll consider a process with a different characteristic equation that's still third order. Consider one that has an open loop transfer function kc over s cubed plus 6s squared plus 11s plus 1. The characteristic equation is 1 plus the open loop transfer function set equal to 0. That gives us this polynomial for the characteristic equation. We'll start by choosing a very negative value for kc. In this case, we'll start with kc equals minus 20. And then we'll find the roots of this equation with kc set equal to minus 20, and we'll plot them in the complex plane. Because this is a cubic equation, there are three roots. One of these roots has, one of these roots lies on the real axis to the right of the imaginary axis. That represents a positive pole for our transfer function, and in the time domain, it represents an exponentially growing function. The other two roots are a complex conjugate pair with a negative real part. Those will represent exponentially decaying sine and cosine functions in the time domain. Next, we'll see what happens as we change the value of kc, and we'll plot a locus of points representing each of the roots in the complex plane, so we can see how the roots change as kc gets larger. 
As we increase Kc from minus 20 to minus 0 0.385, the complex conjugate pair of roots each moves towards the real axis and slightly towards the origin, meaning their real part is becoming less negative and their imaginary part is approaching zero. At Kc equals minus 0.385, this pair of roots converges into a repeated real negative root. Meanwhile, as we increase Kc from minus 20 to minus 0 0.385, the root that was originally on the right-hand side of the imaginary axis moves to the left across the imaginary axis and becomes a negative real root representing a stable pole of the transfer function. The repeated root that's located further to the left of the imaginary axis will represent a function that decays more quickly in time than the root that's closer to the imaginary axis, which will represent an exponential decay that occurs more slowly. As we increase Kc from minus 0.385 to plus 0.385, the pair of roots that had previously converged to a repeated root now diverges along the real axis one of them moving to the left and the other moving to the right. At 0 0.385, the root moving to the right converges with the root that had previously been on the right-hand side of the imaginary axis. And now those two roots converge at 0 0.385, representing yet another repeated root. As we increase Kc from 0 0.385, to a larger value, that pair of roots that had converged now begins to separate into a complex conjugate pair, the imaginary part of which grows as we make Kc larger, and the real part of which becomes less negative. And when Kc equals 60, that complex conjugate pair of roots has a zero real part, meaning it is on the imaginary axis. As the real root moves further and further to the left, it represents faster and faster exponentially decaying functions in the time domain. And as this complex conjugate pair of roots approaches the imaginary axis with an imaginary part that is growing and a real part that's coming closer and closer to zero, it represents exponentially decaying sine and cosine functions in the time domain, which are decaying less and less rapidly as the roots approach the imaginary axis. When Kc equals 60, these two roots represent sustained sine and cosine functions. If we were to in continue to increase Kc, these two roots, representing the complex conjugate pair, would now have a positive real part and would represent exponentially growing sine and cosine functions, making the process unstable. First, we should look for any roots with positive real parts. Any roots that are on the right-hand side of the imaginary axis represent unstable poles. If there are no roots with positive real parts, then we look for the roots closest to the imaginary axis, that is, the least negative roots. These will dominate the kinetics because they will have exponentials that decay more slowly than roots that are further to the left. If the two least negative roots lying on the left half of the complex plane are a complex conjugate pair, then they will dominate the response with damped oscillations in the time domain. And we can approximate the damping coefficient, zeta, and the time constant, tau, by the values of the real and imaginary parts of that complex conjugate pair. The damping coefficient can also be found by taking the cosine of the angle psi that a complex root makes with the real axis. The distance between the complex root and the origin can also be used to approximate the time constant tau. In chapter 11 of the Seaborg text, we first learned how to build block diagrams for standard feedback control loops and that those feedback control loop block diagrams can be used to derive transfer functions for both set point and disturbance inputs. For either type of input, the ratio of the output to the input is the product of all of the transfer functions in the forward path between the output and the input divided by one plus the product of everything in the feedback loop, which is the same as one plus the open loop transfer function.
We also showed how proportional only control leads to steady state offset for both set point and disturbance inputs for many types of transfer functions. We showed how proportional integral control can eliminate the steady state offset. Many systems are open loop stable, that is, they are self-regulating, but adding a control loop can improve the responses. Additional dynamics of control loop components, however, can make a process closed loop unstable, as in the example shown here, where as we increase the controller gain for a proportional only controller, we make the process more and more oscillatory until those oscillations begin to grow in the time domain for large values of the controller gain. In this chapter, we define a stable closed loop process as one for which the response will be bounded for any bounded input. The stability requires that the real parts of the roots of the characteristic equation all be negative. We can use the Routh stability criterion, direct substitution, and root locus diagrams to analyze the stability of closed loop processes.